Hi, everyone. Before we get to our show today, I wanted to give you a very exciting announcement about Path 11 TV. This is a new network that Mike and I created through Path 11 Productions. And today I am going to give you an exclusive code. You won't be able to find it anywhere else. It's if you listen to this podcast. Um, I'm going to give you a code for 25% off your monthly membership of Path 11 TV for your first three months. Um, so you're going basically going to get that membership for seven. $7.49 a month instead of $9.99 a month. And Path 11 TV is actually active right now. Um, it's a little bit of a secret. We kind of have it behind uh, closed doors here. But if you go to path11tv.com, you will see that you can subscribe to our network. We are adding um, footage uh, constantly and regularly. We are going to be launching this more publicly on, guess the date, November 11th. 11 11 2020 around 11 a.m we are inviting some very special guests who will be uh, helping us to launch the path 11 tv on that day so stay tuned for that and um, we have a lot of content there right now we have over 75 hours of exclusive footage we have stuff on ufos consciousness healing i mean you name it it is there i think you guys are going to love it so are you ready for the code get your pen and paper down this is only for people who listen to this podcast. And uh, the code is podcast 25. Again, that gives you 25% off of your monthly membership, providing you three months of free viewing. So go ahead and head over to path 11 tv.com, put in your code podcast 25 and get yourself started. If you're not sure if you want to do that yet, I forgot to mention, we also have a three free day trial. So just sign up anyway, um, sign up if we have other deals or, you know, other contents going on, you'll probably hear about it if we follow that up with a newsletter, but, um, you can try it for three days for free. And then if you like what you see and you don't get a chance to watch it all, which you won't be able to in three days, go ahead and put in podcast 25 for 25 5% off your monthly membership, again, giving you three months of free viewing. So those three free days will turn into three months. All right, guys, and uh, that's all I have for you today. And let's get to our show. Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Welcome, everyone, to the Path 11 podcast. We are going to be talking about alchemy today. And I'm wondering if some of you have actually read the book, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Now, I have not, and I can't believe I have not, but after I introduce you to my guest today and you hear about what we are going to talk about, I know you're going to run out and get The Alchemist book. But the book that we're going to be talking about today is by the author and my guest, Colm Holland, and he wrote In the Secret of the Alchemist. So he actually helps us to decode the book, The Alchemist, and explains all that he learned when he went into a very deep study of this. Let me tell you a little bit more about our guest, Colm. So he is going to reveal to us how we can discover the power to miraculously change the world around you and beyond all recognition and for the better. He tells us the story of his encounter with Paulo Coelho and his best-selling book, The Alchemist, and how discovering the secret in Paulo Paolo's novel gave him the insights to achieve true empowerment in his life. And I know that Colm is so excited to talk to us today and to help us follow our hearts, find the love in our life to be able to manifest what it is that we want in life. So Colm, welcome to the Path 11 podcast. Yes. Hi, Alexandra. Thanks so much for having me. Hi, everyone. Yes. Yeah, so welcome so much. Um, I was kind of blown away and feeling a little like, how have I not heard of this book, The Alchemist, <laughs> when it has sold so many copies? And you talked about Will Smith, who I love Will Smith and Oprah and all of these, um, you know, very well known celebrities that it was just kind of this book that was well, um, you know, mentioned. And 
really strange too. I once had a psychic reading and she nonchalantly had said during my reading, oh, you were an alchemist in a past life. And I said, oh, I, what's that? I don't even know what that is. And I looked <laughs> it up a little bit of what alchemy was. I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, the people that can turn things into different things. Um, so, and then I just left it at that. And then when I read your book, uh, I was really intrigued by all the different concepts and was kind of hoping that maybe you can start us off in letting us know maybe a little bit about how you came to the journey of The Alchemist, the book itself. And then we'll kind of go into the interview that way. And we're going to have to have you explain to some of us who are fairly new with the term of alchemy to describe that a little bit without having to go into the full history of it. But yes, let's give course. our audience um, <laughs> you know, some some information there. So go yeah, ahead thanks, and share. Um... Exactly. We don't have time to go into the full history of, of alchemy anyway. So, um, so that's it. So just for the benefit of those who um, have not heard of the book that um, here it is. This is the book, the original book, Paolo Kahlo, The Alchemist. And my book is The Secret of the Alchemist. And I am going to tell you just briefly how I encountered Paolo Kahlo and his book. And I'm going to have to turn the clock back. If you come with me, uh, 27 years ago, when the book The Alchemist was first published, uh, I was living in Sydney, Australia, on Sydney Harbour, beautiful part of the world, and I worked for Harper Collins, who were the publishers of the English edition of The Alchemist. But 27 years ago, nobody in the world had ever heard of Paolo Kahlo or heard of The Alchemist. It since though, however, has sold more than 85 million copies and has been translated into 70 different languages around the world. In fact, we've estimated that probably at least 500 million people globally, past and present, have actually read The Alchemist. Um, so for a while, uh, Paolo Kahlo, since then, since 1993 it was, um, has actually held the Guinness Book of Records for the most copies sold by a living author, except for one other book. <laughs> and this is fascinating. The only other book that's ever sold more copies by a living author, both authors are still alive, and that is J.K. Rowling's uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Some of you have already noticed that both these books actually cover, in a fictional way, the whole aspect of alchemy and alchemy is central to both of those stories so how did i come across in my role as working in harper cons well, it was really simple i came across the book the alchemist because it landed literally my the mail boy in the days before email came into my office in the business and he literally threw threw this package on my desk it was late on a friday afternoon and said hey carl get a load of this and I opened it up, and it was the manuscripts that hadn't yet been published of the books that, as a company around the world, were thinking of publishing. And in that pile was this book by an unknown author, Paolo Kahlo, and it was the cover, which was just a photocopy stapled to these sheets of the, of the manuscript. And I must have been about probably the fifth person in the world to read this book in English out of what, 500 million people, probably now. And um, I, I looked at it and, and I, I broke the rule, which is you should never judge a book by its cover. And I just love the cover. And if you Google it now, and people are quickly gonna be Googling, the original jacket of Paolo Kahlo, the alchemist, you'll see it's nothing like the one that most of us see in the bookshops today, which is usually this color with pyramids on it and stuff. It was purple. And right central in the middle of the jacket was this Arabian dress figure with the all-seeing eye of God on his forehead. And it said a fictional fable of a boy who want, who's follows his dream to find his treasure. And you know, I normally never used to take work home at the weekend, but it was late Friday afternoon. This book got me. It hooked me, and I shoved it in my briefcase and went home. And then Sunday afternoon, I suddenly remembered I'd got it, and the kids were busy, 
And normally I spend the weekends with, with family, but the kids were busy and I just set myself up in my backyard, got out the manuscript and thought, I'll just give this a quick skim, you know, no more than half an hour. Well, three hours later, after I finished reading every single word and the sun literally set on the last page of the manuscript, I just knew because of my own, I think because of my own spiritual journey up to that point, from the age of 18 to the age of 40 years old when I first read The Alchemist, that there was something unique and magical about this book. And, of course, 500 million people reading it since would probably agree with me, and most of them would say, yeah, there definitely is something magical about this book. And I was surprised that my colleague who had sent it to me hadn't written the note saying, this is going to be a mega bestseller. So I rang him on the Monday afterwards. The first thing I did when I got back in the office when he was awake, because I was in Sydney, he was in California, big time difference. So I, um, I waited until it was about seven o'clock in the morning, woke him up and I said, hey, Greg, um, have, have you read this? He said, yeah. He, I said, look, man, I'm serious. This is this is going to be a mega, mega, probably the biggest book HarperCollins is ever going to publish. And he said, are you serious? I said, yeah, no, no, look, come on. I'm normally Mr. Conservative. And, and, I said, and he said, well, how many copies do you want for Australia? And I, normally I'd say like two, 3,000 copies of a, of a book first time. And I said, look, I want 20,000 copies. Don't forget, Australia's only got, a, at that time, 1993, had a population of about 16, 17 million people. 20,000 copies for an unknown author is pretty <laughs> outlandish. And yeah. um, he said, are you drunk? And I said, no, I'm not, no, I'm not drunk. I'm, I've never felt so excited in my life, actually. We're sitting on a mega blockbuster of a book. And he said, okay, okay, okay. Let me go and talk to the other guys. So he went back and he talked to all my colleagues around the world. And we came back and we printed 200,000 copies. We skipped hardcover, went straight to paperback. And the rest, as they say, is history. We couldn't keep up with the demand. As soon as we did a print run, they sold out and sold out and sold out. He was in the New York Times bestseller list for uh gosh what was it um i think it was over 380 something weeks wow um he has he's continuously in amazon still today 27 years later he's still in amazon's bestseller lists for for his genre and um what was really special for me personally and this kind of wraps but it gives me a bit of closure on this story is that Paolo came to Australia soon after we published. We persuaded him, even though he doesn't, English is not his first language, he speaks and writes in Portuguese. He's Brazilian. And the book had actually initially failed miserably in Brazil, believe it or not. Go figure, right? Yeah. His first publisher actually gave him the book back and <laughs> said, I can't sell this book. And... Um, then he, he went into the desert. He and his wife took some – when this kind of disappointment happened, because he really wanted to be a successful writer, he went into the uh, Mojave Desert in America for a month. And, and there's another book that he's written since called The Valkyries, in which he tells that story of his month in the desert. And he had a very, very spiritual, magical time. There. It's a great little book. So again, it's only a slim. Even the Alchemist, you know, as you can see, is a very slim book. You can read it in a couple, few hours. And when he came back from that desert experience, um, he told his agent to send the book out again. Let's see if somebody bites. And one publisher came back and said, "I don't know why, but I feel compelled in here." to publish your book again, even though I know it was a failure the first time around. It sold half a million copies, which were for Brazil, which is a pretty good guy. And then, of course, we got our hands on it at HarperCollins and we bought the English language rights. So Paolo came to Australia and we got him into a, a literary festival for the first time. And he was very nervous because he was going to have to speak in English. Uh, he did brilliantly. It was a major success. The queue of people, this was only after, you know, a couple of months after the book had been published, the queue of people who wanted him to sign their copy of the book they just bought went all the way around the block in the city, wow. outside the building and all the way outside <laughs> around the block. And 
I don't think even he could believe the response. It was enormous response. And the media were all over him. They all thought it was amazing. So there was these magical, magical things beginning to happen. And and he said, I want to come to uh, to Sydney on my way home um, to Brazil. And I want to, to meet you, Colin, and your publicity director. And I want to take just you guys and your wise partners out f- for a special thank you meal. So we did, and which was amazing. No author had ever done that for me, either before or since, actually. And um, during the meal, he looked at my publicity manager and said, um, Naomi, look, I, I want to give you a present. I want to thank you for looking after us so well. You've been, you've been amazing this week. Thank you. Uh, every need was catered for. And he pulled his hand, he put his hand in his pocket. He said, I asked God and my wife what I should give you. And they told me this. And she opened this little jewelry box and there was this diamond dress ring worth a couple of thousand bucks. And um, nobody, neither of us in our whole publishing career had ever seen anybody do anything like that. And she was in tears and we were clapping. And we know this is marvelous. And then he looked at me <laughs> and he said, Colm, he said, I asked God what I should give you. <laughs> and God, and I'm thinking, oh, mm, what has God told? What has God told Pella? Oh, maybe a gold Rolex. That would be, yeah, that would. Be. <laughs> I've never owned it on my salary in publishing. My meager, meager <laughs> middle management salary, I couldn't afford a gold Rolex. And uh, and, he, and he said, I asked God what I should give you, and no gold Rolex appeared out of his pocket. And what he said was this: God told me to do, a, well, to spend a day of my time doing my alchemy magic just for you. And I've asked the universe to give you whatever you want. You just need to decide what you want. What you want, right. So that's my story. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the magic. That is the day. I've forgotten. I should have written the date there. I've still got the photo. So you know those um, tourist photographers that used to come around before digital cameras? They used to come around, and, and if you were in a group at a table, they used to take a photo to get you to all buy the photo. I've still got the photo. Oh, wow. So, that yeah, I know. Isn't that amazing? So there's Paolo. Those of you who have seen photos of Paolo, that's his delightful wife. That's a very much younger me with dark hair and my wife, and there's a publicity manager and the assistant publicity manager there. So so that photo is 27 years old, and there's a story behind this photo, which if we get time, we'll, we'll come back to it because it's really an entertaining story re- quite recently about that, that photo. Um, what happened to me was quite shocking because at that moment in my life, 27 years ago, um, I was at the point where, you know, when Paolo first asked me, you know, what, what you've got to decide what you want, you know, the shallow answer was a gold Rolex. How how sad is, is that I'm embarrassed to say that, you know, that's how materialistic and shallow I was being. But I had been on a spiritual journey, and so that makes it even more embarrassing. But I'd reached that point, sort of middle age when I kind of sort of thought, well, you know, I've, I've done well. I'm in an okay career. I'm not particularly well paid. I've got other people telling me what to do all the time. But, you know, it's comfortable. I'm in a little comfort zone. But to be honest, I'm bored. I'm actually bored. I'm really dissatisfied. If this is the rest of my life, you know, you're staring at another 25 years of sitting in this little office doing the same thing over and over again. If this is my life, gosh, um, maybe maybe I could do something else. Maybe there's a dream of doing something else that I can resurrect. So thoughts began to happen, and Paolo went back to Brazil that night, and things began to happen in my life. The guys who I reported to both got promoted to other jobs, better jobs outside the company. And I got promoted right up to the director level almost overnight. I mean, that was, wow. That's (laughs) quick. (laughs) Wow. That was within a couple of months. That was, okay, what's going on here? And then the urge, this yearning that I had began to grow, which was I really wanted to start my own business. 
And through a lot of circumstances, which you can read in my book, which I won't go into now, I ended up starting one of the largest digital agencies back in 1997, it was in fact, in Australia. I had 85 staff. We had some of the biggest clients in corporate Australia, including the 2000 Olympics, believe it or not, that were in Sydney. Um, we were doing really well. We were making a ton of money. and th They were great days. And I remember going into the bathroom. I mean, this is what, five years or so later, and that lots of things have progressed to get me to that point. And I looked in the mirror and I actually said, you know, looked at myself, you know, took my glasses, I said, hey, Colin, come on, guy, what, what, what's happened to get you from where you were not that long ago, dissatisfied, unfulfilled, to now, you know, being so successful, fulfilling the dream that you had? Of, and my mind went straight back to that time uh, with Paolo that evening in the restaurant. And I made a conscious commitment right there and then that I would spend the rest of my life exploring the magic of alchemy that Paolo said that he did for me because it had made such a difference in my life, not just materially, not just in my career, but emotionally and spiritually, I had transformed over that, even that short period of time into what I felt was my true self. Somebody, somebody who wasn't that same person five years earlier and somebody who I was actually really proud of being. Whereas before, I think there were many aspects of my life that, that I just wasn't proud of, particularly my fear and some of the blocks, the emotional blocks that I would experience every time I thought of taking a risk. Every, every time I thought of stepping out, and I'm sure many of us listening today are going to identify with me at this point and, and, and knowing that, yeah, you know, you know what, Colm, I, I've got a dream too. And, well, you know, I'm just too terrified to even think that I could fulfill it. And every time, I, you know, and even in relationships, I made, there was such a, a radical shift in, in my relationships, in my private life as well, where, uh, issues that had, had prevented you know, the quality of those relationships were transformed. So I spent, I've committed the rest of my life till now, and I'm still doing it, to what I call personal transformation, to fulfilling the dream, and to discovering what what is the secret in this book. Um, and I believe I found it, and that is that's why I've entitled my book uh, the Secret of the Alchemist. And if you read my book, then I'm, I'm hoping that you will be inspired to follow the points and the, and the processes that I outline in there. And, of course, we use, um, as you know, if you've read my book, I, I actually use the story, the original story of the alchemist as a, a guide, as a, as a metaphor, if you like, to, to uh, outline the processes that, that I explain that I've that I've personally been through. Yeah, I really enjoyed the book. And, um, you know, at the end of each chapter, too, you kind of give the reader something to ponder, you know, after after each chapter there. And, well, I have two questions. But before I ask the question more related to what you have in the book, I'm just curious to know when you spent that day with him, was it and he said that he was going to like teach you and show you his alchemy. Um, was it just being in his presence? Was it just like a day well spent or what did he actually like show you? <laughs> um, I mean, did you actually see some things happen? Um, like the omens that you talk about, the synchronicities mm. in your book, or was it just, you know, he made this statement that, you know, whatever, you just need to know what you want. And by spending yes. a day with me, you know, he, his energy and interacting with yours. Is so, so to clarify, I did, I actually didn't, didn't get, I would have loved it. I didn't get to spend a day with him. Oh, okay. He, before he met me, before, he okay. had spent a day on I his did. own. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, that, oh, that's right. Yes, I, that's right. I remember. Yeah. I remember but, but, now but, as I read it. But no, like, but wait, you've made a really good point. And I love the point you've made. That wasn't a mistake you made there. I, I actually think, that was deliberate. You know, the universe wanted you to say that because the amazing thing about alchemy is that it doesn't even require um, to be in a print. This isn't like counseling. This isn't a workshop. 
This isn't training. This is something much, much higher. It's a, a higher energy that goes back thousands. The wisdom of that higher energy goes back thousands and thousands of years. So maybe this would be a good point where I can give you just a little potted history of alchemy and where how, the, the kind of alchemy, the kind of alchemy that's in this book. Because look, look, guys, it's it says the alchemist. You know, this is what this book is all about, the alchemist, and it is all about alchemy. It's more than just a little story of a boy who leaves his sheep. Those of you that have read it know Santiago goes off from Spain, goes into the desert, and makes his way eventually through lots of overcoming lots of obstacles to actually the pyramids where he believes he's going to find his goal. Um, that is a is really a fable. It's a metaphor. It's a myth. It's a, a modern myth, in my belief, um, for following the path of ancient alchemy, but one particular branch of alchemy. So let me just unpack that. Alchemy began, we believe, about five, three to 5,000 years ago in Egypt, near where the pyramids began. It was um, it first appears in Egyptian mythology with a guy called Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, um, who was the god, who was the go-between between, between the energy of, of the universe and the creator and all of that and, and, man, and mankind or humankind. And that was the beginnings of, of alchemy. And then down through the centuries and the millennia, um, it branched off into lots of ways. Some went, some, one branch went off into China, India, the Middle East and, and Europe um, and different uh, versions of alchemy began to appear. The version that Paolo um, has utilized in his life and explains in, in the story of the alchemist is the Arabian branch of alchemy. And he makes that quite clear. It's not, there's nothing confusing about it. He makes that clear. So what is it about this branch of alchemy then? This branch of alchemy teaches something really important that there is no divide between that which is above and that which is below. So many of us in our different religions, in our different beliefs, we, we, we create this sort of divide between God and, and, and humans, or uh, the divine is up there, is out there somewhere. Um, when alchemy says the divine is, is in here, in fact, it's you. There, there is nowhere else for the divine. It actually is you. You, you are divine, and it's discovering this divine self or the the inner, the true self, is the art of alchemy. Now, of course, most of us think of alchemy as old guys with pointed hats with stars and moons on and stuff, um, buried away. Um, you know the um, the sorcerer's apprentice in, in Disney <laughs> sort of thing. You know in a laboratory trying to turn lead into gold and other substances. Uh, and, of course, there were the European branch of alchemy very much went off down that road. But what one guy discovered, and that guy's name was Professor Carl Jung, who was a, only 100 years ago was um, a, a co-worker with Sigmund Freud, is that within the human psyche there is this massive part of our, of our mind called the unconscious. And what Jung discovered was that the alchemists in his studies, because he was a student of alchemy, the alchemists discovered something really, really significant. And that is that we can transform, if you like, the lead or the unwanted or the base material of ourselves into something really precious really real treasure and that is the discovery of the true self and the amazing thing is that the alchemist discovered and so did Carl Jung is that the true self if we are prepared to take that road of transformation is able to perform miracles can actually do magic so what did Paolo do I've he didn't tell me he didn't say, oh, and by the way, Colm, I, you know, I did this and I had this potion or I went through this ritual or I did that. He didn't say a word. He just told me, look, I did my alchemy work and that was it. Um, in, in Brazil, they, they've got a nickname <laughs> for him, uh, which is Margo, which is uh, in Portuguese means the magician. 
So they actually call him the magician in um, in Brazil, in, in Portuguese. And, and I, to this day, um, maybe I'll, I'll meet Paolo again and he'll tell me, but I doubt it. Uh, the closest I ever got is, as I said earlier, a book called The Valkyries. In that book, The Valkyries, that he does describe quite a bit about his own his own journey into into the spiritual realms of magic and so on. Um, so the rest I've had to work out for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I can honestly say that every time I commit, and I've seen this in so many hundreds and hundreds of people's lives around me, when we commit to pursuing that transformation of the self, when we open ourselves up, to what I call unconditional love. And you've, you've had so many guests <laughs> on your show with their near life, you know, near death experiences rather, and their experiences of, of the world after time and time again. What do they talk about? They talk about encountering unconditional love. So that unconditional love, as they will tell you, is present now. It is and if you like, it's the glue that holds all of spiritual matter, all of material matter together. It's it's the reason that we exist. It's it's the bedrock of everything that is true and full of integrity and everything that is worthwhile. And if you're ever wondering about what your destiny is, if if anybody out there today is thinking, oh, I just wonder. I wonder what I should be doing with my life. Well, one of the one of the tests and one of the ways that you can begin to see omens, as you mentioned before, begin to happen, is to commit yourself to the pursuit of unconditional love. And that begins with one very easy step, and that is to allow and to call on unconditional love to embrace us first, to embrace you first, to embrace me first. And when we do that, guess what happens? All the power of the universe will immediately come to us. One of my favorite quotes in the story of Santiago in the Alchemist, where Paolo Kahlo in his story says this, that when somebody commits to following their dream, all the power of the universe conspires Go figure that. The universe is out there conspiring. Sounds terrible, doesn't it? But it's conspiring in a good way because what the universe is going to do, and this can be a bit of an eye-opener for many people, is that the universe is going to begin to move situations and circumstances and synchronicity because the universe is and love is looking at our heart and saying, what do you want? What is it you're, you want me to do? What, what, what are you calling into your life? What, what, what is your reason for living? What, because that's what the universe will give you. It will give you what you want. So as my wife said to me when I was driving home that night with pa after seeing Paolo, and I said to her, so what do you think of that then? You know, I've been told I just need to decide what I want, and it's just going to happen. You know, what do you fancy, a super yacht? <laughs> do, you want, do you want a mansion in Beverly Hills? And she just laughed and said, I don't think that's what you really want, is it? And I said, no, oh, no, not really. That's that's not where my heart is. Um, and my heart actually said that um, I wanted to just know that I had fulfilled all of my potential, that I had used all of the gifts that I had been given to make the world a better place. Mm. And if that is our goal, if that is our aim, I can honestly say now that you will enter miraculously. And there is no other word to describe it. I'm, I, I'm sorry to keep using the word magic and, and miracles, but it will, your life will miraculously transform. And if you're not sure how that's going to happen, then um, that's what I've outlined in my book, The Secret of the Alchemist is the various steps that you can take, decisions that you can make, um, ways that you can uh, challenge 
the innate fears and um, what I call obstacles, those emotional obstacles that, that rob us and prevent us. Now, look, those obstacles haven't just appeared from nowhere. And sometimes those obstacles are through no fault of our own. And in my case, the biggest obstacle that I faced and have faced most of my life began when I was about two years old. And I tell the story in my book, and I know lots of you are going to sort of chuckle at this, especially if you've read Harry Potter. <laughs> what's what's Colin talking about? What's he talking about, Harry Potter? But he, so what happened was, that I, I, unbeknown to anybody in my family, when I was two years old, my mother was diagnosed, well, actually for a while undiagnosed with epilepsy. And anybody who's had a relative or a friend who suffers from epilepsy, you know what a really terrible and crippling and uncontrollable thing it can be in the early stages before you know, it's diagnosed and treated. And it was in the days when I was two years old, so I was at home. My father would be out of work. My mother didn't work at the time. She stayed at home with me, and she was raising me. And she would begin to have a fit, and she would – obviously, she was – um, she knew something wasn't right. So to protect me, she would throw me into the cupboard under the stairs in our house. And, of course, it was very dark in there, and I was about two years old, and I could hear all this terrible screaming and noise going on outside. I mean, it was horrifying. But here's the thing. It wasn't until I was in my late 20s that I even began to remember that experience. It was so traumatic. I buried it. I can hit it. I it was I split off. Um, in in psychology psychology terms, you know, I, I I became a hysteric. In that that means you don't become hysterical. It means that you your brain, in order to cope with the intensity of the trauma and and whether this is any kind of abuse that you've suffered. In childhood, those of you who've had counselling for this uh, will know that this is a common experience. So where do we put these memories? Well, we put them into our unconscious mind and we try and close the door. We try and, you know, from the outside, we try and close the cupboard under the stairs and hope that that memory is going to stay in there. Well, what I discovered was that the child, that inner child, um, who I thought, you know, didn't exist, was alive and well. And guess what? He was pretty angry about being locked in the cupboard. under the He was angry twice over. One, because it happened in the first place. But secondly, because I was, I was doing the same thing to him all over again. You know, I didn't want to know. So he would erupt. His anger, yeah, I mean, it would just erupt you know, at the most inconvenient moments in my life and he was also very full of um, fear of um, and, and confused about what love is you can imagine one minute the person who i thought was caring and was loving towards me would become my jailer as it were um to the point where i became my own jailer of my own real self and, and i was very fortunate i've got some help and it's all that i won't go into the details now but in the book, I managed to get help, and I managed to face that inner child and give him a voice and, and deal with it and overcome it and so on. And um, I, I know because I, I work with a lot of people, I help a lot of people, you know, through part of this journey as well that, that they're facing, is that sometimes our reasons for the breakdown of our relationships, our sort of sabotage of our careers, so many people, um, our uncontrollable anger at times, um, our abuse, alcohol, drugs, all of these things all have a root somewhere. And Alcoholics Anonymous, of course, teach this as well. And um, so just that is part of the alchemy. So what's this going to do with alchemy? Yeah, what, what are you talking about? I thought it was all going to be about. Now you're talking about psychoanalysis and Carl Jung and the inner child. And well, this is what alchemy is all about. 
And thanks to Professor Carl Jung. And if you've not read any of his stuff, um, in my book as a whole uh, bibliography, I read 14 of his books, actually, to get to the point of, of being able to write my book. Um, he talks about all of this and how by honouring and by beginning to um, believe again in, in that abused self, that part of ourself that we really want to hide and, and despise, uh, by nurturing and allowing love um, and allowing acceptance and removing the judgment from that part of ourselves, we can be transformed. And the alchemists um, had three phases, just really quickly. So they had what they called the black phase, the white phase, and the red phase. And I cover these in my book, just really simply. The black phase is the breaking down and coming to terms of facing that that dark part of ourselves. It, some people call it the dark night of the soul. Um, there's a little cottage in my village. I live in a village in England, and there's a little cottage in my village, and it's called Rock Bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And the street is called Rock Street. And, it, of course, it's the cottage at the bottom of the of the street. But every time I drive past it, I chuckle to myself and say, yeah, I've been there. I've, I've been to Rock Bottom. Um, I know what it like what it's like to live in that cottage. I really feel sorry for that. Actually, he's a very happy guy who lives in that cottage. But, um, <laughs> um, and then the white phase in the middle is about having identified those parts of our souls that we despise and, and, and are crying out for love, is that process of loving on them and allowing other people to love and get, getting help. Allowing other people to to move us on through through away from our, our rejection of the self to an acceptance of ourselves, and then the red phase is called action, and that is when having found the self, the self is going to want to do stuff. The self is going to want to become creative, so to take up those dreams, the the true self. Is the, is the self that, that, that owns the dreams that we've buried in the past. And if we allow love to rekindle those dreams, amazing things begin to happen. So that's the so, so all of those things that I've just described happen here in the original story. So those of you who've read it, um, the story and the journey of Santiago from Spain and going through the desert to the pyramids is – an allegory of the basic steps that you can take with um, with alchemy in the process of, of transformation. So, in a nutshell, that's <laughs> uh, that's who I am. That's what I've written about, and that's what I committed most of my life to now to trying to get that message out there. And um, lots of people are buying my book right now, which is fantastic. Um, People are contacting me, writing to me and telling me how thrilled they are that already stuff is happening. Like, Because one of the things I did, and you will have found this. At the Alexandria. end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. So what I say is this, mm -hmm. that I was so, I was so blessed by, Cal, by Paolo Kahlo when he said he did a day – you know, his, his time to do his alchemy magic for me. But what an amazing, what an amazing gift to do in somebody's life. And I thought, I really want to pass that on. So as I wrote the book, what I've said in my book is that each day before I would begin writing, and I, it was written over a period of three years because I, I was busy doing other stuff at the same time, but I really wanted to get this book right. So I spent three years doing it. Each day before I wrote, I, I would light a candle just as I've I've got here as we're as we're talking together, I would light a candle and I would call on unconditional love, so that I would say when anybody reads my book in the future, that the universe would give that reader everything that they need to become the alchemist in in their world, and an alchemist is somebody who is on the journey of transformation, if you're wondering what, a, what an alchemist is. The, not only are they transforming themselves with the aid of love, but they're also finding ways to cooperate with the love that is in the universe 
to transform the world around them for the better as well. And the the thing that that um, Carl Jung used to talk still well, in in his work he he he's written about this a lot, and you'll hear a lot of people describing this that we are actually all connected to each other, irrespective of race, religion, gender, orientation, geography. It's irrelevant. Um, We're connected, and we're connected through this thing uh, that, that Carl Jung described as the collective unconscious. So... What he said is he discovered, and he's the guy who talked about archetypes, by the way, you know, the wizard archetype, the the hero archetype. That was him. Um, And the reason he talked about that is because he believed that we all have inherited through our evolution. We have all inherited certain traits, certain commonalities that make us human. That even differentiate us from other part, other you know, animals or material things in the world. But then he 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 went even one step further and he said, "But we're not even separate from those things. Our connectedness in the corporate and conscious through archetypes also connects us to the material world." So the, here's a message: if ever there was a message for our time, and our concerns about what we're doing to the planet, that this is it. Now, we are connected to the planet. We have a direct impact um, on the planet. Um, In the book, The Alchemist, uh, Paolo Kahlo calls it the soul of the world. And the soul of the world extends beyond just human consciousness. It also extends into all material things as well. So we do hold... In our, in our hands as, as humans, um, the power to, to create a better future. Um, I know it's a cliche, but yeah, we can save the planet in more ways than we, we've ever dreamt. And that doesn't mean just by changing our consumption of carbon fuels. It, it also is about how we think. It's are we contributing are we nourishing the soul of the world through our thoughts through our intentions through our actions or are we depleting the soul of the world through those things and the life certainly that i want to live and i know you know i think at heart most people want to live is is one where we're nourishing the soul of the world because that gives us purpose that gives us a mission that is the dream that I had um, back in 1993, 27 years ago, that, that I re- managed to rekindle. And one of the things I love about the story of the alchemist is the main character, Santiago, begins the story when he falls asleep in this little abandoned chapel where the roof, there's no roof on the chapel. And there's an old sycamore tree growing there and his sheep are around him. And he has that dream. And it's a new dream, but it's a recurring dream. And one of the things I say to people who who talk to me and ask for help is, I want you to go away and start dreaming again. I want you to listen to your dreams because you are dreaming. You mostly forget them. But um, I have a good friend who actually teaches how to how to have lucid dreams. Um, which is which is amazing. In fact, he's helping um, people who have had um, traumatic stress syndrome experiences, particularly in the military, um, people who are battle worn and torn, um, to to find ways to to enter into those memories in their dreaming, and to transform that pain and that that suffering into positivity in their life, rather than using alcohol or, or any substance to do that. Um, so we can dream again. And one of the things that you discover, the older you get, it, well, in my experience, and I've been around a while, as you can see, um, it's it's really easy to, to say, well, you know, having that dream was okay when I was younger. 
Yeah, it was a, you know, I really wanted to be an actor. I really wanted to be a pop star. Um, I really wanted to be a healer. I really wanted to be a psychic. I really wanted to be whatever. Um, I really wanted to be a nurse. I really, whatever. Um, those dreams that we sometimes have buried just because the demands of life and family and just pr putting food on the table have taken over. Um, the great news, and the, that's why I love about the story of the alchemist, is that we can revive those dreams. They may not look exactly like the original dream. The circumstances around how those dreams will get manifested may change. But the, the fact is, there is nobody, no matter what age, who can't begin to be manifesting out of the power of unconditional love into their world again. And some of those dreams can't exactly be practically the way that we had them when we were kids or young teenagers, but in some form they can be resurrected and be manifested again. That's what I that's what's so exciting about life. Life, you know, never ends really, does it? We we have one life here and we're who knows what the next um, what we're going to um, looking forward to you know that experience as well but right here and now we don't have to wait we can have that intimate relationship with the power of unconditional love and it can um, create new worlds around us Wonderful. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you one more question before we go, because the only thing that left me feeling a little confused, um, and I agree with all of this, but is where, you know, you kind of say in the book that we really, um, you know, are in charge of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. It is, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. have the ability to manifest what it is that we want. We do it through this unconditional love, yeah. um, that, that life is not faded. Yet, how then do we, how do I wrap my mind around these synchronicities and omens that then happen? Um, because it feels like that maybe there are some things that are destined and that the universe, like you said, conspires with us. Yet, yeah. at the same breath as being the alchemist, you also have the ability and the power to make choices and change and create the life that you want. So this is just something that I kind of rack my brain with of how do okay. I, how is that? So no, it's how, really you no, can no, it's that. a fabulous question, and I wish more people asked it actually, because there's an assumption we make, which is the one that um, our lives are governed by the stars or the hand that wrote all or, or whatever. And I'm so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to read from The Alchemist, all right? I'm just going to read a short passage. It's on page 18 of my edition. Look, look, you can see all my underlinings, my well-loved well copy. Um, and it is the story right at the beginning of the book where Santiago is sitting in a marketplace where he's beginning to think about this dream that he's had and what, what should he do? Should he go off, abandon everything and go in, off into the desert? And this this character, an elderly character, male character, appears, um, who initially we, we call the old man. Um, I won't uh, steal all the thunder you, you that you're going to have through, but those of you who have read the book will know what I'm talking about. Um, so the the um, the old man sits down next to Santiago, and Santiago is reading a book, and the old man. Um, looks at the book as if it was some kind of strange or, or, um, object, it says here. And he says to Santiago, this is an important book, but it's really irritating. And the boy was shocked. The old man knew how to read, which he, he didn't think the old man did, and that he'd already actually read the book. And if the book was irritating, as the old man had said, the boy still had time to change it for another it's a book that says the same thing almost all of the books in the world say, continued the old man, and it says this. It describes people's inability to choose their own destinies. And it ends up saying that everyone believes the world's greatest lie. So Santiago goes, so what's the world's greatest lie, the boy asks. It's this, that at a certain point in our lives, we lose control of what is happening to us. 
and our lives become controlled by fate. That's the world's greatest lie. And the boy says, well, that's never happened to me, and so on and so on. And it, later on in the book, um, uh, this old man who is, whose name is Melchizedek uh, actually says to Santiago, you can choose your own destiny. And Paolo has a word for this, which he, if you watch any of his interviews, there's a fabulous series of interviews between Paolo Kahlo and Oprah Winfrey on YouTube, which I strongly recommend, um, in which he, he talks about this. And that is, there is a destiny that is individual to us, but we, are, we have to be co-creators of that destiny. And our choices within that journey, which he calls our personal legend, we are the masters of those choices. And when we make a choice, the universe then will join us in that choice and, and make the path plain and, and will lead us. Um, there are times, there have been times in my life when I haven't made what I would regard as good choices. And what I've discovered about that, because I've already made a commitment to follow unconditional love, and I expect love to help me in those choices, quite often I just find the door gets shut, almost slammed <laughs> in my face. Like, no, I don't think that's such a good idea. What do you reckon, Colin? Do you think that's such a good idea to do that? Oh, now you come to mention it. No, that probably that's not very helpful. Uh, maybe I should reconsider that. So my what I talk when I in my book when I talk about you are the captain of your soul. And Oprah Winfrey um in, in some of her podcasts as well says exactly the same thing. I'm not saying anything new in that sense, is that you can be the captain of your own ship. You don't need to be rudderless. You don't just need to be blown around by circumstance and the winds of fate or whatever, whatever you want to call it. It's really easy to believe in fate retrospectively. It's easy to look back and go, oh, yes, I can see why that happened or maybe why that happened. It's really hard to predict fate into the future, and that's because you are the master of your fate. So the life you want to create is within your grasp. That's really the message that the alchemist teaches, that uh, Oprah Winfrey teaches, and, and hopefully I've, I've managed to convey in my book too. Wonderful. Yeah, and I think it always comes back to when you talk about the choice, choose love, right? Always choose love. It's everything. In fact, can I just – I know we're going to close in a moment. I just want to read you from um, the sentence I've written right at the very beginning – uh, of, of my book is, is sort of this sets the scene the the greatest challenge that we face is to truly believe at the very core of our heart that we're loved unconditionally for who we are and not for what we can do mm -hmm. if that's the case then to coin a real cliche the world is our oyster is it not? Because we are loved. So if we're not feeling terribly loved today, can I advise or suggest that if you get a moment to just be on your own, just find find a little corner somewhere, wherever you are, in the office, at work, at home, doesn't matter. Um, just find a little corner and just say to yourself, I want that love. That, that Colin was talking about and the alchemist talks about. And I want that love to begin to, to imbue my life, to infuse my life and to help me move forward from, from where I am right now. And guess what? Love will come to your aid in a flash, <laughs> mm. in a heartbeat. It's just waiting. It's just waiting to join your life at some point. Colm Holland, thank you so much. The Secret of the Alchemist, people. Let's go out and uh, purchase that. And so where can people buy your book? Uh, everywhere, pretty much. Um, Google it. It's on all good online bookstores. Um, I don't know if the bookstores are open 
physically where, where you are, but that's, if not, don't worry, you can, there's a Kindle version, there's a paperback version, and there's even an audio version. If you're not bored yet <laughs> with my voice, um, and you're quite happy, you know, um, but people who have problems reading or would rather listen to it while they're doing something else, I've actually got an audio version, which is available on Google and Apple as well, so... It's a wonderful book. And it's really the only book um, that I think I've ever read when I got into the end of it where the author blesses me. And that was beautiful. I love that. So thank you. And if nothing else, <laughs> I think people should get the book to be blessed and you know, <laughs> passing on what Paolo passed on to him. And, you know, the intent is there. So yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Colin, thank you so much for a beautiful talk. I really appreciated spending time with you today. And um much luck with uh, the book. And um, if you write another, come on back. I'd love to. Thanks so much for having Thank me. Thank you. April. Have a great yeah. day. Okay. Cheers. Thanks again, everyone, for listening to this week's show. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you to listen to our new podcast, Mindbenders. Visit mindbenderspodcast.com to hear my dad's synchronistic story, I hope it'll bend your mind about Jimi Hendrix. Then submit your story if you think it can bend our minds. Also be sure to check out the video replays of the 2020 Virtual Afterlife Conference. We have over 17 hours of amazing presenters exploring the survival of consciousness after death, working with hospice professionals, physicians, mediums, clergy, counselors, and alternative healers to offer a deeper understanding of death and beyond.